Right, I think we make a start. So welcome back everyone to the fourth and final session of today's LFS and APS uh, user conference. You are here now in the parallel session for uh, methodological innovations. If you'd like to join uh, the other parallel session on, uh, I think, subjective well-being, then please join the link in the uh, chat. Uh, the passcode is there as well. Um, so we've got uh, in this session two fascinating uh, papers lined up um, and um, Lorenza and Xabi are making a start. Um, so Lorena and Lorena and Lorena Cruz Serrano is a senior economist in the Arab City Economics and Planning team. She has a master's in uh, public administration from the London School of Economics and over five years of professional uh, experience in uh, infrastructure, uh, policy analysis and governance. And Lorena was part of the team in the uh, Freeports monitoring and evaluation project, which produced the Power BI dashboard. And Xavi Pogoni uh, is a senior economist in Arab City Economics and Planning team as well. Um, he has a PhD in urban and transport um, economics, um, economics from the Imperial College of London and more than nine years um, of professional experience in the field of economic research, analysis uh, and evaluation. And Xaba leads the uh, data and quantitative evaluation work stream of the Freeports Monitoring and Evaluation Project. Uh, which produced the Power BI dashboard. And uh, they're both now presenting uh, their paper titled UK Free Ports Monitoring and Evaluation, the Innovative Power BI APS Dashboard. So if you're both ready, I'll hand over to you. Yes. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting us for this session. I am going to share my presentation. Hopefully, it's going to work. Um, yeah, I think it works. So my name is Charles Pogoni. I'm, uh, as Martina mentioned, a senior economics, a senior economist in the Arab City Economics and Planning Team. And uh, this is a work that was done by actually several people. It's only me and Lorena now presenting it, but we have we are essentially um, a team, and we have produced this dashboard and and the underlying methodology as well for the UK Freeports Monitoring and Evaluation Project. Um, I think it's important to first talk a little bit about the program, which might not be uh, uh, clear for everyone. So this is um, this is essentially a project which which monitors and and evaluates the impacts of the UK free ports program. Uh, free ports are special areas within the UK which are which are essentially uh, produce different economic uh, regulations. So th this is essentially a spatial policy uh, where there are essentially three types of important benefits. First one is uh, that in case a firm moves to these areas, then that firm receives tax, tax benefits. There are also caps, customs benefits involved, and there are also seed capital funding available for local infrastructure projects. Um, there are 10 free ports uh, in the UK currently. Eight of them are in England, and two of them are in um, in Scotland. And I think the reason why this is a really interesting project is that in most of the cases, uh, also today, what we've seen in this conference is that what essentially we do is that there is a certain policy which happened a couple of years back in the past, and we wait a couple of years, then we do an evaluation. We want to understand exactly what was the impact of, of that particular policy and want to understand how much of its aims and objectives were actually um, reached. And then, and then we want to feed this back in, into into the into basically the into science, and then make sure that the next time there is a, a certain decision being made on a, on a policy, then we, we learn from previous um, learnings. What we do here is a little bit different. Um, essentially, we the, the the monitoring and evaluation strategy started almost at the same time as the pro, the policy itself which essentially means that we are also really interested in monitoring the results. And this is also the reason why we created the dashboard. And this is also the reason why we created these uh, synthetic uh, free port areas all across the UK as well. And this also means that we really have an opportunity now that in case the evaluation finds uh, 
early findings, then we're able to feed this back. And the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities, uh, the, the, the UK government department responsible for this program, is able to potentially tweak the, the policy to make sure that we are maximizing uh, public value. So this is really a, an exciting opportunity, I think, for a researcher to actually uh, get involved with uh, what's happening on the ground. Um, as I mentioned, essentially, there are these large set of measures. This is, in case you're familiar with the literature, you definitely would understand that this is a spatial policy, which is uh, an interesting mix of investment zones and, and uh, special economic zones and free trade zones. Um, but this is a, a new type that was kind of uh, especially made for, for the case of the UK. Uh, it has essentially three important goals. The first one is to promote regeneration and job creation. And this is the government's lead policy objective. The second one is that they want to make these places hotbeds for innovation. So they want to ensure there is um, clustering of economic activity happening there, and not just any type of clustering, but they also aim at uh, producing uh, uh, high value added jobs and green jobs as well. And uh, the third one is to make sure that these areas are becoming national hubs for global trade and investment across the UK as well. Yeah. Um, so as, as I mentioned, the purpose of the monitoring and evaluation strategy is to assess the effectiveness of the policy, understand what works and also why, and, uh, and evaluate whether these objectives have met and to what extent, and see how much of this is actually the direct impact of the program and not just due to background growth or any other important economic or other shock. Um, it is also important to note that what we are doing is, is, um, is not just evaluation, but but we're also trying to work together with, with, the, with the ministry to kind of uh, make, it, make it easy for them to engage and, and also understand not just our final outputs, but also how we got there. This is the reason why we started creating, we actually created the first iteration of this Power BI dashboard. And the reason why we think that this dashboard can be really interesting is that instead of just producing a report or producing a, a slide deck with many, many charts, this actually provides the opportunity for experts within the ministry to be able to um, explore the data themselves and uh, filter and, and create those charts that are interesting for them. Um, it's also important that once you once you create a, a dashboard, you also have to have a, um, an effective data pipeline. It essentially means that uh, we, we wrote everything in Python and we, we also tried to automate as much of the process as possible because essentially every half a year we are updating the whole of the dashboard with new data coming in, with new monitoring data coming in, and we're also producing uh, monitoring uh, results based on that. Um, as I mentioned, this is, a, this is a project funded by the UK Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities. And um, it's not just our company are working on it, but we are leading a consortium which, which uh, encompasses Cambridge Econometrics and Technopolis as well. Uh, I think there is one very important uh, or very interesting part of our, of our project, and that, that's this kind of no free port program counterfactual. So in many cases in econometrics or or in any kind of evaluation, what we do is that uh, we do a, po a post a post evaluation and uh, and using data both before and after the implementation of the policy, we are we are trying to create um, a no policy counterfactual against which we are measuring the impact of the policy. Um, we we also we kind of take this take this idea and then uh, and then use it already for monitoring. And in order to do this, we came up with this synthetic freeport uh, method, where we essentially use a propensity score matching algorithm. And for each of the freeports, using areas which are similar to uh, the actual freeport area, but they are not directly impacted by it, we are creating this kind of weighted averages of three, four, or five local authorities from elsewhere, in this case, England and Wales, to make sure that. Um, that we have a good counterfactual for each of the free ports. So essentially, in the case of England, for each of the eight free ports, we created eight synthetic free ports. And this, this helps us hopefully going forward that once we get gather uh, uh, a new set of monitoring data, we gather it both for, for the free ports themselves and we also gather it for these um, the synthetic free ports. And we are basically 
uh, arguing that the observed difference is most likely mostly due to the program itself. As I, uh, the reason why we're here on this conference is that we have used uh, the APS as well, but we are not. We were not just using the annual population survey database. We also used several other publicly available data sources, and we also did a data gap analysis. And there were just um, quite many crucial indicators that we were unable to um, gather from publicly available data sources. This is the reason why we also created a um, survey. And uh, that survey every half years is sent to the Freeport areas, and uh, and uh, we can ask certain questions about their operations and, and also what's happening on the ground, and and that kind of these this kind of survey fills the data gap. And this means that we're really in a, in a really I think special special um, uh, situation that hopefully we, in a couple of years time we will be able to do a, a mixed method holistic evaluation where we are. We will be able to answer whether this program was a good value for money. Also, in case uh, we see significant impacts, we will be able to answer why uh, and and maybe why not those objectives were achieved. What we see here is an example tab uh, of the dashboard uh, that we have been uh, working on. Uh, as uh, Chao already mentioned, the idea behind this dashboard is for it to be a centralized source of information um, for the monitoring and evaluation of the freeports, which will facilitate the measurement of freeports' performance against uh, outputs defined in business cases, synthetic freeports that Chava already talked us through, uh, and also economic baselines and forecasts. Um, Chava, next. Um, so um, what we see here is not just a snapshot of each of the free ports and at the moment as well, prospective free ports, but also it will allow us to draw comparisons um, against uh, um, different free ports and also against free port areas yeah, and the UK more generally, and also to allow uh, the analysis of trends across time. This uh, dashboard, as uh, Chava mentioned, is going to be updated regularly twice a year with both public data sets and also primary data directly reported by Freeports. And uh, in such, it will be uh, a source uh, of up-to-date data for relevant uh, stakeholders across government and allow the monitoring uh, of the program at any point in time during the monitoring and evaluation period and beyond. Next. And um, just uh, to show a different tab um, of the different uh, indicators that we have uh, been selecting uh, to include in this dashboard, ideally the dashboard will allow us to track the program's uh, objectives across time, mostly uh, in terms of job creation, leveling up, uh, freeports becoming hotbeds uh, for innovation and also increased uh, trade and investment. Thank you. So essentially, this is what we wanted to show. As you can see, this is very much um, uh, just the first iteration of the results. And we don't really have any actual monitoring results yet. This is uh, uh, just the results of the, of the initial baselining uh, um, analysis. Uh, but basically, I think what's really in interesting here is that, for instance, on this, uh, on this da uh, dashboard, on this tab of the dashboard, on the lower left chart, you can see that in the case of Liverpool, for instance, we created, um, uh, we show basically total jobs per year for each year between 2015 and 2021, and, oh, sorry, 2020. And basically you see that the, the synthetic consortium that we have created follows um, the trend of, of the actual Liverpool report area quite closely. And this kind of gives us hope that once we would get the monitoring results, then, the, this uh, synthetic uh, free port method would actually work and it will be a really useful comparison for to understand the impact of the of the policy. I'm very happy to answer questions or receive comments as well, of course. Um, and we'll now move on to our second presenter in this session. Uh, that's Chris Martin from the University of Bath. Chris is a specialist in uh, labour markets, macroeconomics and monetary economics with expertise in surge fric um, frictions um, and new 
Canadian uh, DSGE models. He has been a professor at Bath since 2010. And current research topics include a study of the impact and aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic on the UK labour market, estimating uh, real wage um, rigidity and using machine learning um, to explore heterogeneity in the UK labour market. And he'll be presenting his paper on heterogeneity in the UK labour market using machine learning to test macroeconomic models. Over to you, Chris. Thanks very much. <laughs> I'll just share my screen if that's okay. That's working now. Great. Okay. So, well, first of all, thanks very much for for um, letting me speak. And we're very my uh, co-author and friend Maglin and I uh, are very keen for your comments on this. So, if you've got any comments, please let us know. If you'd like to have a a, a copy of the presentation, there's there's quite a lot going on in the presentation. I'm only going to do highlights today. Then please, uh, you know ask us in the chat or send us an email, we'd be very glad to respond. So what we're doing in this uh, presentation is we're really uh, looking at three things. So um, here's a summary of what, we, what, we, what we're trying to do. The first is what do we do, is what we find, and the third is why do we do it? So what do we do? We use machine learning, as you say, to investigate the main sources of heterogeneity in the UK labour market. OK, what do we find? Well, what we're going to do is going to apply a clustering algorithm to data on individuals. And when we do that, we find that membership of clusters is driven by two things, occupation and education, which we regard as proxies for productivity. And therefore, we conclude that the main source of heterogeneity in the UK labour market is around productivity. Why do we do it? Now, we come to this as macroeconomists. And as macroeconomists, macro there are long-standing issues in the analysis of labour markets, which are accounting for differences between individuals, specifically differences between individuals in terms of productivity, can help us understand those problems. So just to give you a flavour of that, I won't go into detail you can see now is a list of six things which are allowing for differences in uh, productivity between individuals helps us get a better understanding of better under appreciation of, of those issues there i won't spend time going through those issues but you can see they're clearly pretty important issues okay let me skip ahead and look at the research question so there are two main research questions the first we've um, already touched on which is are, there difference, are differences in productivity uh, mainly driven by productivity, differences in productivity, or, or are there other sources of heterogeneity in the UK labour market? And subsidiary to that, can we discriminate between different models in the theoretical literature? So this is how we come at it as macroeconomists. There are different sorts of models, theoretical models, in the macroeconomic literature, and we're trying to discriminate between them. Okay, now I'm going to use machine learning. Now, why? Fundamentally, it's actually very simple, which is that we're trying to explain heterogeneity. There is no obvious measure of heterogeneity. So there is no obvious variable that you could put on the left-hand side of a regression. So in the absence of a clear measure of heterogeneity, what we're going to use instead is clustering. So how does clustering work? The idea of clustering is that it will partition the data into one of a predetermined number of clusters or subsets. In our work, we're going to be focusing on the case where there are two clusters. So basically, every observation in our data set will be allocated to the first cluster or to the second cluster. Okay, And that's not been done arbitrarily. It's been done to uh, maximize a, on the basis of a criteria. And the idea is that the clustering algorithm allocates data points into a cluster so that data points within a cluster are as similar as possible and as distinct as possible, as different as possible from data sets in other clusters. In other words, I'm maximizing the similarity between a cluster and, and maximizing dissimilarities between clusters. Now, how is that helpful to us? Because when we look at the characteristics of individuals in one cluster, compared to another cluster, what that will do is it will point out to us the main sources of heterogeneity. So we see clustering as a very useful tool for addressing what are the main drivers of heterogeneity in the UK labour market. 
Okay, let me skip ahead slightly in the presentation and let me just show you our data. Here's our data here. We've got 25,000 observations. These are individuals, they're from the Labour Force Survey, and we're taking the the last the last survey before the pandemic. So we're using 2019 quarter four. And what you can see here are the variables that we, we will use. So for each individual, we will have measures of these characteristics. And these characteristics are binary. It's a one or it's a zero. So the, the first three characteristics are about occupation. They're based on the standard occupational code. And basically, if your one digit SOC code is between one and three, you're in the high skill group and there's a value one for the variable, which is high skill, and a variable zero for the variables, which are medium skill and low skill. So you can see how that's done. Then we've got a bunch of variables which measure education, whether the individual is a graduate, whether they have A-levels or higher, whether they have GCEs or higher. So we've got three measures of education. And again, those are binary measures. You can see the whole sample average in, in the right-hand right -hand column here. But there are many different dimensions to heterogeneity. For example, there's heterogeneity in gender. So we have a measure of whether the respondent is a female or not. There are, is heterogeneity around uh, ethnicity. So we've got a measure of whether or not the individual is non-white, a, a very crude measure. We've got a measure of whether the individual is, is young, aged uh, 30 or less. That's another dimension of heterogeneity. There's geography. And here we've got measures of whether the individual is employed in London or in the Southeast. We're looking at different sorts of contracts. So we're looking at whether the individual's on a temporary contract, on a zero hour contract. And we're looking at tenure. Has the individual been in their job for one year or less, a short tenure, or in their current job for five, year, five years or more, a long tenure? Are they looking for a new job and also uh, whether they're employed in the public sector? So there are many dimensions of heterogeneity there. There are something like 18 to 20 variables. So each data point consists of 20. Each individual has got 20 uh, observations, which are over one or a zero. That's our basic data. And we're going to basically subject this data, all 25,000 individuals, we're going to put it through a clustering algorithm. So let me say a little bit more about clustering at this point. So as I said at the start, what clustering aims to do is allocate data points into clusters in order to maximize similarity and also to maximize dissimilarity between clusters. A clustering algorithm is defined by a central point. And if I show a, a picture, here we go. This is a, a, a very, a, an idealized uh, visualization of how clustering works. It's based around, uh, it's based around a, the central point. In our case, the central point is median. And here you can see a, a stylized representation of a bunch of data points. The colors have got no meaning. The size of the dots have got mo no meaning here. But we've got two clusters and you can see the median point of cluster one on the left and the median point of cluster two on the right. I should say this is highly idealized. In practice, you do not get separations between clusters. This, this, this data set clearly has two, obviously it's got two clusters. In reality, it's much more complicated than that. So what the, what the algorithm does is it, it, it tries to determine what is the central point of the cluster and allocates in, uh, data points to the cluster to maximize similarities between the cluster or rather minimize the distance between the center of the cluster and members of the cluster and maximize differences between members of one cluster and members of another cluster. That's the idea. Now, one of his question is, well, how many clusters? Now we're gonna use two clusters. Let me briefly explain why. We're gonna use something called the silhouette statistic. And what you can see here is the silhouette statistic for our data in the case where there are two clusters. So what you can see here is uh, information for every one of the 25,000 individuals in our data set. And basically, this is capturing the measuring the silhouette. The silhouette is a value between one and minus one. A value of greater than one basically means the distance between the data point and other members of the cluster is greater than the distance of their data point to members of another cluster. So the data point fits well in within its allocated cluster if the silhouette is positive. And in this case, you can see there's only a very small number of negative silhouettes. 
Fine. Now we do this for, we calculate these statistics for two clusters, three clusters, four clusters, and we calculate some simple statistics that you can see on the next slide. The blue bars are the average silhouette statistic where we look on the left at two clusters, then three, then four, then five, then six. And you, this criteria is maximized in the case, <coughs> excuse me, in the, in the case of two clusters. The average silhouette value is highest in the case of two clusters. The orange bar is the proportion of cases in which the silhouette statistic is negative. And here we want it to be minimized and it's minimized where the number of clusters is equal to two, although it's less clear in this case. So on the basis of this, we're going to work with two clusters. In the associated paper, we look at what happens if there are three clusters and four clusters. So what we do is we say, yes, there are of this evidence and we run our data through the clustering algorithm telling the algorithm that there are two clusters. There were some technical details here which arise from the fact that there were 25,000 observations as it's a large data set so the, has, the algorithm has to do some sampling. I, I can um, if you're interested, you can contact me and I'll talk about that more, but for, let me not dwell on that now. Let me just say we're going to work with two clusters. And let me show you what the results look like. Our results are captured in, in this table here. So these are our main, our main results. The column head at all is the all sample average, which you've already seen. The column headed 2A is the first of our clusters. The, col the column headed 2B is the other cluster. And what we're doing is we're looking at differences between the averaged values of a characteristic in cluster 2A compared to the whole sample. The average value in cluster 2B compared to the whole sample. So if we look at the first row, which is high skill, 83% of members of the first cluster are in uh, high skill jobs, their SOC is either one, two, or three. By contrast, only 21 members of the second cluster are in so called high skill jobs. We highlight in red cases where the cluster average differs from the whole sample average by more than 40%. It's got no statistical value at all. It's purely a visualization device. If you were to do t-tests on the differences between values in one column compared to another column because of the large sample size, everything here, all the differences are significant at very high levels of significance. So coloring in red is simply a device to highlight the largest differences. So you can see that in terms of high skill, cluster 2A has got a lot of high skill individuals, cluster 2B has got a, a, a smaller number. If we look at medium skill and low skill, you can see relatively fewer members of cluster 2A or in those occupations, those occupations are much more concentrated in cluster 2B. So it's clear that there is a separation within our sample in terms of occupation. One cluster has got high skill jobs, the other cluster has got medium and low skill jobs. So there is evidence that there is clustering around occupation. Okay, which we think is interesting. Now let's think about education. Here, the results are even stronger. If we look at the case of graduates, the graduate column, uh, the graduate row, in cluster 2A, 74% of members of that cluster are graduates. Whereas, in sharp contrast, only 2% of members of cluster 2B are graduates. So there's a very clear difference, a very strong difference in terms of membership of clusters, in terms of whether the individual is a graduate. Looking at whether the individual has A-levels or higher, the same is true. 87% in cluster 2A have at least A-levels compared to only 7% of cluster 2B. And if we go down to GCSEs, the same is true. 98% of cluster 2A have at least GCSEs. Only 42% of cluster 2B have at least uh, GCSEs. So there's a clear separation in terms of occupation. There's a clear separation in terms of education. Those are interesting results as by themselves. If we interpret occupation and education as proxies for productivity, here is strong evidence that you can, you can, you can cluster our data on the basis of productivity. What about these other measures? Well, the next row, for example, has got female 
there are differences. There are more females in cluster 2A than cluster 2B, but the difference isn't as large. The same is true in terms of ethnicity and age and geography and tempi contracts and long and short tenure and even in the public sector. There are differences, large differences in terms of zero hour contracts, but only 1% of our sample are in zero hour contracts. So that's really not a very uh, important measure simply because there are so few workers um, on those contracts. So in terms of our research question, you, we can distinguish between individuals on the basis of occupation and education, which we take to be measures of productivity and not on these other measures. So this is some evidence to support the argument that you can distinguish between high productivity jobs and low productivity jobs, which give support to the macroeconomic models that we are that we got that we were interested in and which led us to get into this question. Okay, let me in the remaining time demonstrate the credibility of those results. So how do we how do we demonstrate the credibility of those results? Well, the first thing we do is we do what's called a validation exercise. And this is simple. We simply randomly divide our sample into two subsamples, just randomly allocate one observation to one subsample, randomly another to another subsample. And we cluster on each subsample. And we ask the question, in how many cases is the data point allocated to the same cluster if we use the subsample or the full sample? And the answer is over 96%. So in almost every case, whether you cluster on the whole sample or the subsample, you get the same result. So that's, an ev that's evidence of robustness. Okay, if you know a little bit about clustering, you've probably heard about k-means, the, the, the k-means algorithm, a very well-known uh, algorithm. We do not use that algorithm because k-means, the center of a cluster with k-means is the average of, a, of the cluster, and the average may not actually be a member of the cluster, which is why we instead we use the median. If we use the well-known k-means algorithm, then 90% of our data points are assigned to the same cluster as they were with our main algorithm, which is the k-medians algorithm. We also use what's called soft clustering. And with soft clustering, we you don't assume that every data point belongs to one cluster or another cluster. You allocate a probability that they do so. Okay. Interesting, but kind of complicated. In that case, 91% of data points are allocated the same cluster with soft clustering as they are with k-medians. Okay, so let me just quickly summarize. What are we finding here? We're finding the main drive of cluster membership is occupation. And to the extent that these are good proxies of productivity, then we can conclude that the main source of heterogeneity in the UK labour market is around productivity and not these other dimensions of uh, productivity, uh, other dimensions of heterogeneity. And as I said at the start, this supports the use of theoretical models in which distinguish between high productivity jobs and low productivity jobs. I won't go through the rest of this slide because that gets into, into more detail about the macroeconomic models. How can, we, how can we take this forward? Lots of interesting ways we can take this forward. The first is that in this paper, we only consider employees. We could include the self-employed, the unemployed, and the inactive. And that's something that we aim to do that actually that we're currently doing in um, other work. We're currently applying this to the issue of inactivity, which of course we're all very concerned about at the moment, trying to understand what it is that leads to inactivity and what could be done to move to encourage inactive individuals back into employment where that's um, relevant. More widely, this is an example of the sort of thing that you can do with machine learning. Once you explore machine learning, you come to realize it's actually quite familiar. If you're familiar with econometrics, machine learning has a lot of familiarity and there's nothing really very scary about it, but it does open up a very wide range of new tools that we can we can use. So we can look at old questions in a new way, but more importantly, we can look at new questions, which is very quite exciting. And as we move into the world of big data, things like machine learning, which are designed to deal with, with big data become more and more important. Okay, I'll leave it there.